Shipro, the 824 generic. Perfect. Are you going to do the little thingy? Is it you who does it? The little wrap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll give yeah, you yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, cool. you're in the corner. Sorry. Yeah. You'll hear my stomach growl. And then you're like, okay, you know what? Brandon got to eat lunch. <laughs> um. Okay. All right. Um, Sam, we'll start with you. Um, how did the idea for the original play come about and how did you come to adapt it for the screen? Yeah, I uh, started working on this play about 13 years ago. Uh, at the time, I was teaching expository writing at Rutgers. Both my husband and then boyfriend, now husband and I were teaching expository writing. And I was kind of desperately trying to connect to my deeply disaffected college freshman students who didn't want to be there. And uh, at one point I became kind of desperate and just begged them to write something honest. And one of my students wrote a line that ended up in the play and the film, uh, which was, I think I need to accept that my life isn't going to be very exciting. Uh, and so then I just had the very kind of arcane idea of writing a play about an expository writing teacher trying to connect with a young person. Um, and I had a few false starts, uh, but it wasn't until I started to put some more personal stuff on the line, uh, started accessing some personal history of mine surrounding growing up gay in a small town in North Idaho where Charlie lives and attending a fundamentalist school, much like the church that Thomas attends and um, falling into depression and self-medicating with food for a very long time. Uh, nothing in the play or the movie is autobiographical, but it's kind of like auto fiction. Uh, and so when I first started writing it, I thought maybe this is just for me. I mean, maybe this just wants to be an act of therapy or purgation. Um, and then I just very slowly started showing it to people. And now, my God, here we are. Um, so Brendan, what drew you to this project and this character in particular? Well, the word out, went out that uh, Darren Aronofsky was going to make a film and he was interested in meeting with me. And you know, clearly the answer is yes. He's a world-class director. Um, I sat down with him and I knew very little about the project apart from that it was the story of a man who had been living alone, who had certain regrets for his life choices, um, that he had been overeating to such the extent that it was very harmful to him and his health. And he had limited time, five days if, and he has an epiphany of sorts that he really has to accept the circumstances. But more than that, he must reconnect with his estranged daughter. And I knew only that. Darren explained to me that he didn't know if he was going to make the movie or not. It was really contingent on lots of things, namely, you know, the elephant in the room was, who am I going to cast for the role? And I was hopeful that it would be me, but he had to explain that it would be creating a character body um, much in the same way that you would do with any special effects, makeup, or costuming or apparatus and that he had his longtime collaborator Adrian Moreau working for him on this um, to create Charlie, a man who weighs hundreds and hundreds of pounds, um, who lives in his two bedroom apartment in somewhere Idaho alone and um, to do that with as much authenticity and dignity as is possible. So that meant creating um, Charlie's body to obey the laws of physics and gravity, as which is may seem counterintuitive, but we haven't really seen this makeup done this way before in films that I can think of and I, I looked really closely at many many films I looked at many actors who live with obesity in films to see how the types of characters that they were asked to play that their what their objectives were were they just there as a as a one line one note cheap joke or was the the uh the outfit that they're wearing the same and I was comforted that in the whale this is not that and an entire production team went into creating Charlie. Um, 
And then there's the story that moved me in ways that I was not anticipating. I finally had sighted the screenplay. It rendered me speechless. It made me feel like having kids of my own that I could identify with the need to connect with your child, even when you think that it's impossible, um, as Charlie does, but you still must try no matter what. Clearly, my circumstances aren't the same as this character's, but it fueled me. It gave me a great deal of inspiration and strength, and it upped the stakes of everything that that I felt I had to bring to, to playing the part of a man who is that first and foremost he's a person he's a human being he's an educator he's a father he he's an optimist um he's not the person as he merely presents and um that beautiful dramatic conceit that sam wrote the story hinged it on asking us to not overlook those and dismiss them as we're so often want to do, but look deeper. And by story's end, I knew that we would be challenged, if not outright converted, to admit that we're now going to reorient and gather ourselves about how we feel about this story and the vestiges of the prejudice that we do hold as a society walking into this that will undoubtedly be changed by stories and yeah i mean you answered a lot of my questions <laughs> um but one thing that i did uh, two very quick things what was it like you know there was a three-week rehearsal process what was it and, and you were on set the whole time mm -hmm. what was it like or, and that's not, you know, standard for like a writer to no. be on set the whole time. No. What was that like for both of you personally to have that kind of interaction? Hopeful. Uh, I hope so. No, absolutely, absolutely. No, it was. I mean, there's the joke about living playwrights, right. and all, you know, but this was not that case because he was there to let us know what the emotional reality of these characters, knowing it intimately from having had, uh, had it produced in New York and all over the country and, uh, all points of the compass since and 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 having had uh written and translated his own stage play to his screenplay is not an everyday occurrence that happens and it, it was a, a rare boon and commodity and resource and the, those opinions were always um i mean those questions were always able to be brought to sam in the best way possible and, and i know that he 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 uh, always welcomed the dialogue that we had creatively that arose through the rehearsal process because that's what it's about um and and uh I, I, what i admired most about not only being given that amount of time to do that so that we you know frankly knew what our job was before we showed up at the built set um was that it brought us so much closer together and not just because it was made in the time of COVID and something interesting happened that we wound up caring about one another even more to be careful, but it, it gave us a stronger sense of purpose to, to have, um, have the resources that we needed um, right there on the day in a small company. Um, it, it was very helpful to have Sam, stand, Sam standing by. <laughs> I mean, I would oh, oh, go ahead. Go on, go ahead. No, I, I was just so grateful to be there, as you point out. Like, it's so uh, rare for the writer, the screenwriter, to be on set the entire time and being given the gift to work closely with with Darren and Brendan and Sadie and Hong and see it all come together. I mean, I over the years I've written, I've had like fifteen or so different plays get produced, and so I, I know that process very well of like developing it and then going to the rehearsals. And I've always, over the years, I've really realized that the the best way I can be of service to the team as the writer is to not come in to a rehearsal process like, oh, I'm here to make sure that it is set a certain way or that the lines are right. I mean, it's really not about that. It's It's once I've developed the script, once that is done, I'm there to be in service of everybody else. Uh, and, and that's 
both because I want to be, I, I want everybody to feel supported and I want people to feel like they have room to add, but selfishly, it makes it better because, because I don't always have the right idea, you know, and there were many things that I would learn about the character and the story from Darren, from Brendan, from Sadie, just by watching them work. And so really like, you know, yes, I was there to be in service uh, to everybody around there. And it, even down to like, I curated Charlie's uh, book collection. You know, that was like the first thing Darren had me do was like to go into Charlie's apartment the first day one of on set before I think you were still in makeup, but I just like went to your <laughs> library and pulled and added stuff. Um, so, uh, I mean, what a gift, you know, as a first time screenwriter to be welcomed in like that. It, it was a, a rare and beautiful thing. And I also think that like everybody was so, it was in the middle of COVID for many of us, I know for me, it was like the first thing that we were kind of doing in person. I hadn't been in a rehearsal room for years, you know, and uh, I I think we all took care of one another. Yeah, you know? by far and away. I was hoping there would be a garage sale like at the end of the movie, you know what they do? Because <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted like the first two shelves behind the dining room table for my own collection, but I think they went back to the set designer. I, I think, think those, that was... <laughs> I want to go to the book sale. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. Can we take care of Let's Cut, please? Awesome, thanks for playing. <laughs> Some gotcha questions.